You do not want to miss any of the next speaker. I promise you that. So a lot of us have grown up watching television. I know I've grown up watching television. And that was our portal into the world, our vision into the world of what the rest of the world look like. But these days, things are different. Things are changing rapidly. Right now we have YouTube, we've got interactive TV. But what does it actually even mean, interactive TV? Media is changing so rapidly, becoming more and more digitalized. But even traditional TV is being digitalized. So what does this mean? Is it just a way of uh, distribution? Or is it also a matter of changing the content? That is something our next speaker knows everything about. Our next speaker works for NBC TV, works on new media, interactive content, and knows everything about this topic. Please welcome, all the way from Los Angeles, California, John Canning. I'm now a little nervous that I'm supposedly know everything about this topic that they're supposed to be known. But I'll, I'll try to work through that. Um, I called this topic to interact because I found throughout the years of doing first screen TV, second screen TV, interactive TV, uh, any kind of interactivity you want to think about that people got more and more confused about what is it really. And so let's go back to the definition of to interact. What is it really? Well. Actually, to interact, quite frankly, is coming down, saying hi. How are you doing? Nice to meet you. Good to meet you. Where are you from? Czech Republic. I can't even pronounce that. Czech Republic. Czech Republic. I got that part. OK. You know what? That is interacting. It doesn't have to be digital. But quite frankly, a lot of people in my business start forgetting that, and they try to make all the tech work, and they try to make it fancier, and they try to make it more interesting, and they forget some of the key tenets of what we're doing, which is to interact, which is to have a connection with people as you go through these things. So I've worked on some of the major projects that you could think of in big TV. I've actually worked on, well, former Dutch shows, The Voice in the U.S., where we do audience voting and working with these people. And we're breaking this down to a couple of key tenets. And don't worry, I'll eventually get to VR, because I know that's the cool, fun thing as we like to talk about it. But we're going to break it down to a little bit about what exactly do we mean when we start building interactivity. A couple of key things. To know your audience. To love technology. And I know that sounds a little weird, but actually I feel good saying it in a place like this to craft those news stories. One of my favorites, disrupt, evolve, repeat. And always the future being yesterday. So knowing your audience. I find that the key thing is we build interactive experiences for television, for movies, online, is trying to first understand who you're talking to. To know that somebody's from the Czech Republic. To know that most of you have probably consumed more Red Bull and energy drinks than I've ever had in my entire lifetime by this point. Yep, there, yeah, yeah, yeah those two right there. Uh, I appreciate that. It is to understand who you're reaching out to and what experiences you're building. Are these people that have the cell phone in their hands? Are these people that are more likely to pick up a phone? Are these people busy watching the show and not wanting to interact in that way? And so it's going to that to know the audience. It's about reach. It's about deciding how far you want to reach. And frankly, it's about the economics of that reach. And this is where I like to start diving into a little more of that virtual reality and that conversation. I've worked with mainstream voting platforms. I've used, worked with social networks. But all of those are mechanisms to that interaction. What is the best way to reach that audience? 
So we were looking at a couple of things around virtual reality being that new way to reach the audience. The shiny new penny, that we like to call it. A lot of people in the industry, in the media industry, have decided that's the cool new thing. We gotta do virtual reality, let's go do it. All right, well let's break it down a little bit. So again, thinking about our audience. So you've got free, which is what most people think about a cell phone or a smartphone. You've got the Google Cardboard, the Cardboard, super cheap, number of them out there, sometimes they're just given away. We got the Samsung Gear, not too expensive. The Oculus Rift and the Vive coming out, and then the HoloLens, I actually did see one over there. But then we started applying some other economics to that. And once you start looking at things like how much a cell phone plan costs, Add that to the cardboard, because cardboard is just cardboard without the cell phone. The Samsung Gear, again, just a nice pretty piece of plastic without the cell phone. The Oculus Rift and the Vive, we calculate maybe 1% of the humanity out there in the world, if that, has a computer that can actually drive those experiences. So the new computer that you have to buy when you actually have those. Now, most of those computers, I think, are actually out there right now, but... And the HoloLens, that's a good question because that isn't even out as a street value. So, looking at these different things and thinking, oh, this is the way I want to interact with my audience, you have to take a moment, you have to pause, and you have to say, how much of my audience really has that? Now, if you're developing something that frankly targets one of those audiences in that small percentage, you can go with it. But you have to understand who has it. Now, never before in my media career, and I've been doing this for quite some time, did I ever work on a product that actually suddenly had worldwide ubiquitous reach before we actually perfected the art. With the advent of Facebook and YouTube releasing their 360 players, you suddenly have this worldwide distribution of 360 video. Now, is it what people would call true VR? Not necessarily. But the fact is, is you can reach almost anybody in the world with it, starts making an interesting audience. But again, knowing what you can do with that versus a headset with hand controllers is a different thing. But as we watch the growth of these platforms, and certainly that baseline, because you can get some simple interactivity now with the gear, in the US, the cell phone population is exploding. This number starts to reflect in other parts of the world. What I love is the global smartphone by 2020 starts looking frighteningly like the global population. And then Facebook's average monthly viewers. Just some quick numbers along the way. So another chart, just to bring it home a little more to Europe, which I found interesting, given the population that comes to Campus Party. Spain is way up there in people who seem to want VR. Although I do have to give the Dutch a hard time because they're at the bottom of the list. I don't know. But the interesting thing is the awareness, the growth, the interest. Because when I look at interactivity between folks and what we can do with it, putting people in an immersive environment and then bringing other people into that immersive environment, that's where we start getting some inter interesting interactivity and touch points. So today's VR landscape. From a mainstream media standpoint, it's a bit challenging. What I love is the other segments that frankly are many addressed here are the other places where this is an immersive environment, data visualization, medical, uh, industry, those are the areas. Mainstream entertainment does suffer a little bit because the challenge is I've got to deal with a demographic in a mainstream media industry that again, I look at those price points and then I look at what kind of stories I'm going to be creating on top of that. So today's landscape, a bit challenging. There are no standards. So if you want to deploy something, you're all over the map. You see a lot of different products coming out there in different segments to try to entice people, to take them and say, this is going to be it. We're still not sure that's there yet. 
But these other segments, frankly, are the ones that I'm excited about. When I step away from NBC Entertainment and I step into my documentary filmmaking hat, this is one of the most interesting areas that I think when I go out and film that I can put people immersively in an environment and potentially let them interact with that environment in a much more interesting way. This is the other challenge right now, is this dog's breakfast is what they call the European VR environment. And I guarantee you there's one chart for the US Euro VR environment. And if you look at what is happening in Asia and the investments out of China in this area, it explodes even more. And all these different areas, it is rapidly exploding. At one point, I've seen a chart of about 500 different companies of all shapes and sizes in this point. All going after, again, a market segment that is very, very small at this point. But where do we see it popping? Gaming. I forgot to mention that earlier. Gaming is one of those areas that, let's face it, it's the no-duh moment for VR. What I have not set up here today is VR is a new way of storytelling. Because it's not, necessarily. If you talk to any game designer that has been involved in a first-person experience in games, VR is a no-duh moment. Designing a first-person immersive environment in a game, we're just getting them better visualization tools. They understand this storytelling environment. And the eValkyrie, is frankly one of those I can point to and say, well, of course, this would make a great VR experience. If you're not familiar with it, it's, based, it's a game from CCP out of Iceland. Um, it puts you in the uh, cockpit of a space fighter. Again, sort of a no-duh moment for VR. But from a gaming experience, an immersive experience, although this one is labeled as intense, I believe, um, which I believe is code word for bound to make you hurl if you're not careful. But a single player experience, putting you in the cockpit, these are the kinds of experiences that allow you to interact with that environment. Frankly, once you put it as a multiplayer environment, then you have your environment acting back on you. And you can imagine where this company is going. Eve is known, I mean, CCP is known for Eve, which is the massively multiplayer space game where millions of people are playing against each other. In this case, you're now a one person in the spaceship. You can just imagine where they're starting to evolve that. So if you haven't seen it, uh, oh, the other thing to note is, unlike other media titles, this one is now day and date. So as an entertainment property, releasing it across all these platforms and pushing it out. So a little bit, if this works, ooh, there we go. So a little bit of the experience. And if we could have some volume on this, it'd be great. My canopy explodes. And my body freezes. But I remember everything. Every victory. Every escape. Every mistake. And I learn. I grow. I improve. All right. Moving on from that one. Uh, it's interesting to note. What we're looking at these experiences, and when you talk about VR, there's 2D 360, as I said, is sort of the base. Facebook, YouTube, not very interactive, other than you can pan around an environment, scroll around it. What starts getting interesting about these experiences when you start adding these other elements to it. Audio, always key. In fact, it's probably one of the most underlooked areas of interactivity, especially in this area, is good audio can bring you into an environment just as much as the visuals. When you have that sound all around you, popping, making your head turn because you want to see what's going on over there. 
then you can add the other senses. And we see, you, know, you can see some examples out there. I think there's a chair for the Samsung gear where they strap you in and turn you upside down. Nothing says interactivity like turning you upside down and shaking you vigorously and seeing if you can make you lose your lunch. I think the people that have had a lot of Red Bull should try that next. I, never mind. Um, but again, from a point of a consumer and getting them to interact, where we have spent a lot of time in media simply trying to get you your cell phone and to vote, going all the way to some experience that is putting you in there in a first person with audio that it makes you feel like it is happening to you and then physically touching your senses, this is that step of interactivity. Now, if I move to another entertainment property, this time actually mainstream entertainment. And I would say that The Martian, which is a takeoff on The Martian, the movie, they built a 20 to 30 minute VR experience for this that went beyond just saying a glorious here is the movie, but went to the point of putting you in the spacesuit, having you interact with the environment as much or as little as you want, and moving through a portion of the story that was independent. So here's just a little bit. Now this is the 360 experience, so you'll notice that the visual is a bit wacky. This was just a trailer they built for the beginning of it. The worst part of th about these things is I want to sit there and move you around, and I, I can't. Now, what you didn't get a sense there, the full 30-minute version, actually, you have your hands in full view. Um, there was a couple of interesting experiences they've done with this. One company actually wrapped a school bus with a Martian-like experience. So the kids were in the school bus driving over Mars. So everywhere they looked out the windows, much like the Hyperloop example, instead of driving down the street, they're driving through Mars. So again, taking these experiences and wrapping them in slightly different ways. But again, one of the examples of some of the high quality thematic storytelling that we're doing with this. Because the key to these is not to just tell the same story with a 360 experience, but to tell an independent story or to give an, a story that you can interact with. Fox is a studio has been going heavily into this area. And what they've been developing are independent stories that go even more beyond their original IP. So when I say love technology, this is one of those areas that if you do not embrace the technology and understand what it can do or not do for you, you will fail. VR is still at that moment that if you're going to shoot it, you need to understand how to shoot it and then how to process it. Some of the DIY stuff is fine. If you don't do the post-processing properly and the stitching fails, the experience fails. Because there's nothing worse than breaking your experience is when the person is in two separate halves. It's really kind of a bummer when you start looking around. Audio, being able to process and capture 360 audio. So again, understanding the technology of this field, working with the technology and embracing it, especially in its early stages, quite frankly, is necessary. The other thing that technology allows us to do and we can look at and apply in this area is how we are addressing audiences. So I talked about the fact that as a big media and entertainment company, we can find it challenging to reach out to a wide, wide audience when I realize a very small segment has the high-end headsets. If you're a smaller property or going after an audience that you frankly know has made those investments, say, a la the PS4 or a 
you know, if you're a sci-fi channel, knowing your crowd is a much geekier crowd, then you can start making those investments and you can start playing to that area. Or if you're going to a broader, then being able to say, you know what, frankly, I'm going to work with a 2D, 3D experience and I'm okay with starting at this level and being able to hit a much broader audience. But again, targeting with your technology and what you're building and the interactivity based on the audience you're trying to reach. This is something I can't stress enough as you start thinking about this, is crafting a new story and not just trying to drop this experience into a, an existing story. Because frankly, the way you create these experiences and the way you create the interactivity of these experiences is not just dropping a 360 camera into the middle of it and saying, there, it is now VR, aren't we all happy? Again, if you understand that the fact that you're now shooting in 360, the fact that you can't be in the scene, the fact that there is no blind spot, the fact that you want to play to that camera, the fact that some of these cameras have fixed focus and you have to be a certain distance from it, all of these things are about crafting the new stories or taking the original IP and saying, how do I tell this in a way that takes advantage of that camera? So you bring it together. It's about telling the right stories, using the right technology, frankly, having the right strategy to what you want to do, and then doing something great. I can't stress enough that I've talked to a lot of folks that are trying to get into this and you realize that the bar has been raised. It is not enough now to just put out something that has eh, okay stitching and say, this is my master project because it will be that difficult to watch. If the audio sucks, it doesn't matter how good the video is if people can't understand it. And I think that's probably a key theme that could be this entire conference, is finding the disruption moments, working with them, and then repeating that in that cycle is the way we keep evolving and pushing the barrier. It's interesting that I went after the Hyperloop folks because I find that this is what they're doing. It applies to creating new and interactive stories as much as it involves building a new way to transport people, is pushing the boundaries and saying, what can we do different? How can we do it differently? And then still make it work. If you think about it, by the time we finish talking about these things and we start iterating on these things, we find that already it's moving, the pace is changing so rapidly, I constantly am looking out there and there's new cameras, there's new ways of doing post on this material. It is pushing, pushing, and pushing. So if you think about it, there is no standing still. Finally, I can't emphasize enough. Think about what the value is, what is unique about the story and the way that you're touching the audience. And how can you leverage that? What is the thing that you're bringing to this? Is it new technology? Is it a new approach? Is it an original story? And then focus on that and hone in on that. Thank you. I've been told that I have to throw the green square at you by myself, just so warning. Is there anybody that's got questions? I don't feel like throwing a square at you, though. Why don't I just come visit you with a mic? I mean, I could throw a square at you, but that seems cruel. I could also suffer feedback. Hi. Does it work? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great talk. Um, I was wondering, like, the more interactive um, something becomes, the more uh, the more emotional becomes it for the person like to be part of it and isn't that like another challenge for the developers to um, make something um, but be, be aware of 
how that Im impacts the person who is playing it or is watching it? And oh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, and I have to say, it doesn't matter. I mean, I've, I've run a vote on, again, we'll go back to the Dutch show that we have in the States called The Voice. Uh, and I've been involved in that vote. Help run it, curate it. And, and again, it's very simple. We're not even sophisticated VR for a second. The passion to which people, when they start voting on something and feel that their vote matters and it counts, and if they feel like there's a mistake, like that's when you realize the true passion comes out. It's like, oh yeah, people are voting. Ah, it's a, it's a singing show, who really cares? If they perceive that there's been any mistake or that their vote wasn't counted or their voice wasn't heard, and social media now enables us to scream at the top of our lungs, is amazing the connection that people make, even in voting, which I find super, like you're voting on somebody singing. Yeah. But it's super passionate. Now take that to stories where I have seen people get more involved in the storytelling. And frankly, the VR type of stories that I think are more, most impactful are the more documentary oriented that put people much more in the situation. Um, I've shot uh, in several different places in Africa where being able to drop a camera in the middle of something and, and let people experience it in its totality is far more engaging and powerful. And so you do have to realize that. You do have to realize you're going to be putting people in situations where before they were able to distance themselves a bit, now I'm putting you right in the middle of it. Um, I, I, I heard this, it was secondhand, but I thought it was fascinating. The, one of the creators from Grand Theft Auto, which is a, a video game, it's fairly violent. Um, okay, it is violent. Um, apparently played it VR and had a bit of an, a moment revelation of just how violent and visceral it can be when you take that w one step deeper in into the environment and now you really do feel like you're behind the car driving over the little old grandma. It does change it. The sense of presence and the sense of immersion doesn't take it to that next level. And that's certainly something that's very powerful. So how do you let people interact? Do you have a story that can unfold in front of them even if they don't want to interact? So those are the decisions you make because it was, it, the discussion is with somebody who's like, well, it's like the, you know, choose your own adventure. Well, choose your own adventures are actually structured. They just feel like they've got the unlimited possibilities. But ask any game designer, and it literally starts here, branches out, and comes back to here. But the fact is that I'm giving you, and if I do it well enough, enough feeling of choosing your own path that you get invested because you're making that time and energy. Any other questions as I hold this mic away from me and try not to do feedback? Thank you for the interesting presentation. Yeah. yeah. Okay, a question about the technology, yeah, yeah. video technology. Yep. Most uh, VR, VR, VR videos are 360 mono. Right. But they don't have depth, no 3D vision. Some of them are 3D. As you might know, making 3D video is much and much and much more difficult. Yeah. Um, do you see an added value for having 3D 360, or is mono sufficient for most things at this moment? Uh, taking into matter uh, the, the, the the difficulty you get with 3D. Sure. Uh, we'll we'll dive into that in a couple of different ways. Okay. So the the question really is: is a lot of VR you see, especially on Facebook. Uh, YouTube is mono, you know, ocular, right? It's not stereoscopic. Um, that's, some of it is because they don't support stereoscopic. Um, also, most of the cameras are not stereoscopic. And the more expensive rigs are, but those are more, and most of them are all completely custom, right? There isn't a mass manufactured pro level VR rig out there on the market. Um, you know, you've got Jaunt, which is making their second generation. I think they've got 20 made. Most of these are still handmade. Now, you've got the um, prosumer line that's coming out, and those are all mono as well. So part of the problem is the camera gear that's making it 
most of it is not, and it's harder. Um, you do have some of the stereoscopic folks, but then they're pushing into your addressing a, a market, a very, very small marketplace that can support stereoscopic headsets. So this is the, the you know, do I go to the broad? Do I go to the niche or the broad, right? I can go to the niche and I can give them a very high quality product that is stereoscopic, but it's a very small group of people. Now, if somebody pays me for that, you know, this is the who's paying for it, how does it get produced? There's a lot of, uh, a lot of investment money that's going into projects. So the higher end projects, you're seeing people be able to do custom pieces. They're chasing that customer. They're making those high end uh, stereoscopic pieces as showcases. But the reality is, is they know that they're not reaching a broad audience with it. So then you have the folks that are not dumbing it down, but making it, and sometimes outputting it in multiple formats. So that's the sort of next step, which is some people are shooting in stereoscopic, but then can output mono for a broader brush of viewing capabilities, but then also support like an HTC and uh, an Oculus. So I think the Nirvana is the stereoscopic. Um, some of that doesn't matter depending on how close you are to the object. Like, uh, you know, if, you're, if everything is far away from the object, then stereoscopic doesn't matter as much. If you have something, like if I was going to do drop a camera here in this crowd, I might want stereoscopic because there's things that are closer. I'm, I want that sense of, sense of depth. The challenge is, I mean, if I was just putting it back up there, uh, you're all relatively flat anyways. So again, also what kind of shooting you're doing would matter, uh, matter. And, you know, let's face it, people are cutting corners these days because getting a good stereoscopic rig is not cheap. Any other questions? Bueller. Great. Thank you all for sticking with me because there was something about pizza and I felt bad that I was keeping you from pizza. All right. Off to pizza. Thank you.